All right. Thank you for the introduction, and I want to thank Sam Gilliland for inviting me to speak with you today. It's a bit unusual um, for the chamber to hear such a topic as emotional abuse, and I'm very, very happy that you were interested. Um, I will tell you a little bit about myself. I grew up in the Twin Cities. I have two grown boys and a black lab named Layla, and I now live in Hudson. Let's see. I'd like to start us off with a fable that I wrote called The Frog Kisser's Epiphany. Once upon a time, there lived a woman who desperately wanted to find her prince. But rather than searching among castles, she started kissing frogs. One day, she met a frog who she believed had great prince potential. But when she kissed him, nothing happened. Nevertheless, the frog was enchanted with her and she with him, so ma they made their home alongside a pond. She continued to kiss him over and over again to help him become the prince she was certain he wanted to be. Yet with each kiss, her prince dreams drifted further and further away. I used to be a frog kisser, and I'm here today to tell you more about what I have learned. I, um, I grew up with emotional abuse. Most of my life I've been in emotionally abusive relationships and I've finally left and healed. Very, very grateful for that. Um, I grew up in, a, in an emotionally abusive family. My family loved me tremendously and I loved them. But my mom had some mental health issues and my dad had a mental illness. He had bipolar disorder. And when he developed that, he became very emotionally abusive. So I tried for six years to have a good relationship with him and just it wasn't gonna happen. So I broke off my relationship with my dad for 20 years. And I don't regret it one bit because I didn't need that abuse in my life. What I found out was that his family blamed me for the lack of relationship. Anyway, we are back and reunited now and with some good boundaries in place and because he's older and his mental illness has lessened, we can have a good relationship. <clears throat> so because my dad was sick and I couldn't help him and I couldn't help me, I developed an insatiable desire for resolution. So I would intentionally look for men who needed my help, and I thought, if I could only help them, then I would heal too, and I would get that sense of resolution that I had been seeking with my dad for all these years. I tried it. It didn't work very well. The men didn't want to heal. So um, I'll tell you about my most recent relationship. <clears throat> um, we met when it was a vulnerable time for both of us. Our relationship started very quickly. Um, he was a therapist. He was very nice. My boys got along really well with him. <clears throat> but before long, I found out that he had been lying to me. He told me he had been divorced for two years and he had only been divorced for nine months. Um, he also had things that would appear on his phone. I happened to come across it one day, and it was very upsetting. <clears throat> so I talked to him about it, and he said he wouldn't keep doing that. Well, then I got into this phone checking mode, and every time I checked, there was another thing that was really upsetting. And I started to think, is this abuse? It just felt horrible. I felt, I felt um, jealous and anxious pretty much all the time in that relationship. So I learned about emotional abuse, and <clears throat> it's harder to recognize. You don't just have a black eye, for example. And there's many, many forms of emotional abuse. So I thought, man, I got to remember these. There's so many, so many examples. So I came up with blockhead. <laughs> 
This was something else when it was um, when I presented to women, but right now it's blockhead. Um, <laughs> uh, the B stands for bullies. They bully, bully you, yell at you, swear, or they criticize you or intimidate you. L, they gain leverage by isolating you. O, they observe and monitor you and try to control you. C, they make you feel crazy. They make you feel like you're the one to blame. K, they send knives to your heart. They say things to you that they know will hurt you the most. H, they humiliate you or shame you. E, they exaggerate your flaws. A, they act like you don't exist or they give you the silent treatment. Or D, they deny things and lie. So I realized, okay, I'm living in an emotionally abusive relationship, but is this really abuse? How much abuse is too much? So, let's see here. I realized at this time that emotional abuse, whether it's intentional, unintentional, occasional, or mild, it's still emotional abuse. So for example, in the case of my dad, it was unintentional. He didn't want to be abusing me, but he was. So it did qualify as emotional abuse. And with my boyfriend, he had been severely abused, sexually abused by his own father, and then abandoned by him at age six. Um, his dad ended up being a bigamist, um, had wives in every state. Anyway, he would get triggered by something, and then that's when he would abuse. So I call it trauma-triggered abuse. So, you know, the intentional abuse is the power and control type of abuse. But all of them qualify. I like to come up with a scenario for you to understand how much abuse is too much. Because it's funny, I would ask myself that question. How much abuse is too much? That seems like a stupid question, right? But he was really a nice guy, 90% of the time. So I, wasn't, I was really confused. So I like to point, come up with a scenario. Let's say you are at a formal restaurant and you order a juicy filet mignon steak with Bernays sauce. Well, this waiter who looks a little bit sneaky <laughs> comes over with your steak and he asks you how much Bernays sauce you would like on your steak. And you look in the pitcher, and there's not Bernays sauce, but it's raw sewage. And you're going to eat this whole steak. How much raw sewage would you like on your steak? A tablespoon, a cup, or do you want him to cover your whole steak with it? In other words, there's no, there should be no tolerance for any abuse emotional or otherwise. And there's the raw sewage. <laughs> um, so the thing that got tricky is that I was so conflicted that I would often leave and then return to the relationship. So I did that probably six times. And um, the average number is seven. I don't remember how many times I moved out, to be honest. Um, but it's, it's a process like that. And I believe that the people who don't physically move out, they mentally and emotionally move out a number of times before they actually finally leave. All right. One of the reasons I was stuck and confused is because I didn't want to throw the baby out with the bathwater, you know? And the goal here is segregation. So you want to see, yes, this is a good man. 90% of the time, I really enjoy him. So that's a positive, mostly. But over here, you've got the abuse. And that's 100% bad. Right now, the two are intertwined. And so you have no choice but to leave that person. So you do throw the baby out with the bathwater. The other thing that happens is you fall in love with Dr. Jekyll, and you go through these highs and lows in your relationship. 
You're having a wonderful time in your relationship and out pops Mr. Hyde. And you fall asleep. And then it happens again, and it happens again. Until finally, and sadly, the abuse gets worse or more frequent or both. And when that happens, it becomes integrated. And every time you see that person or talk to them, you see both Jekyll and Hyde. So then came the question of how can I safely leave? I decided in my case that I would leave while he was at work. So I loaded my dog into my car and I started putting as much in my car as I could because I did not want to go back anytime soon. <clears throat> Unfortunately, he came home from work early. And so as I was running up and down the stairs, I received the worst abuse I've ever had. And he was doing the knives to the heart thing. So he would say things to me like, your kids hate you, you're a terrible mother, you know, and just really, really painful things. But I did get out of there and I left and I had nowhere to go because I had asked friends and family members if I could stay with them for a while, but they didn't want to accept my dog and I wasn't about to leave her behind. So I was lucky enough to have been able to afford to stay in a hotel for six weeks with my dog. And I call it high-end high homeless. I really did feel homeless. Um, I felt disoriented. I didn't know what the future hold, held. I was vulnerable. I was just lucky enough to not be in a shelter or living in my car. So you see, not everyone who goes through emotional abuse lives in a shelter. It's people like you and me who are experiencing emotional abuse. In fact, <clears throat> 50 to 80% of us have experienced emotional abuse either directly or indirectly through a friend. 50 to 80%, which is a very high number. So, <clears throat> excuse me, I learned a few things after leaving things that I would do differently. The first was to always have someone standing by when I leave. And the police will do this for you as a civil issue. If they have time, if they're available, they will stand by as you move things out. But they don't stay very long sometimes. Um, it might be 20 minutes. If they don't have things going on, they might stay longer. Um, have a safety plan. Have someone you can call. Have someone who already knows when you're leaving, have a place to go, and hopefully you've put that safety plan together with a therapist. Have a bolt bag. A bolt bag is something that you can have already packed with the things that you need to survive every day. So, for example, medication. That way, if you needed to leave very quickly, you could get by for a while. Never leave while they're at home or during a heated argument. Statistics show that that is when the worst abuse occurs. And never tell them where you're going. I didn't do a very good job of that. <laughs> and the reason was, is because at this stage, you're still in denial to some extent. You don't fully realize that, yes, that person is an abuser. That just seems like such a strong word. And so, what happened with me is I moved an hour away, um, which was really helpful. And then um, I would sometimes be in contact with him by phone, sometimes in person, and then other times I blocked him. And um, so basically leaving, it's really more of a process than a one-time event. So eventually I cut it all off when I was ready to, blocked him on my phone, blocked him on my social media, and didn't look back. I also began to develop boundaries. So boundaries were something I wasn't brought, brought up with. So I had to teach myself how to have boundaries. And it's not an easy process. Sometimes you make too strong of a boundary, sometimes it's too weak. Um, but I did start making good boundaries, and that really helped because now 
I could take some time for me to heal. And that was kind of like reversing the flow of your river. You're so used to focusing on the other person and trying to help them that it just seems so odd to focus on yourself, but then it starts to feel wonderful. So let's see how the frog kisser fared. Before long, the frog kisser noticed that her frog's skin was rough, like shoe leather. Could it be that he's a toad? She wondered. No, that would be ridiculous, she thought. But when she asked him about it, the frog became enraged and burrowed him, buried himself deep in the mud, just like all frogs do when things heat up. There he remained, shut down in his comfortable state until he was ready to emerge. Over time, the frog no longer burrowed into the mud. Now, every time he became upset, he sprayed the frog kisser with his poison. Sometimes the poison would make her skin itch. Other times it would burn straight through to her heart. Several times she moved to a different pond, only to return. After all, her desire to make him her prince was all consuming. One day, after multiple poisonous encounters, the frog kisser had an epiphany. Her frog never wanted to be a prince in the first place. The wish was hers, not his. She then became aware that his skin was gray, not green. There were warts all over his body, and rather than having long legs that could leap far distances, his, his legs were short and stubby. He really was a toad. I feel like a kindergarten teacher. <laughs> Once she realized that she was living with a toad, she carefully planned her exit. For she knew that if she found out, if he found out she was leaving, she'd receive the worst poisoning yet. One morning, the toad came home after an exhausting night of feeding on beetles and spiders and took rest under a nearby log. The frog kisser had been waiting for such a moment and knew it was her best chance to leave. She had made plans in advance to stay with a friend and had packed all her important belongings. On her way out, she left a note for the toad, but was careful not to tell him where she was going. That was very hard to do, given that she had only recently discovered that he was a toad, and it hadn't fully sunken in yet. After spending some time with her friend, the frog kisser found a place to live that was far away from ponds and lily pads. There she built strong friendships with other women, made a commitment to her own healing, and found a therapist. And she began to fill her own bucket with love. It was so different, yet so wonderful, to do the things that brought her joy. In an effort to not go down Toad Lane again, she read books and attended courses. There she found other smart women like her who had gone through similar things. What a relief it was to relate to them. Eventually, she discovered that she no longer had any interest in kissing frogs, or toads for that matter. Instead, she had worked hard to heal and now loved herself beyond measure. And as far as princes, not just any prince would do, for now she knew her worth and had developed a list of discerning criteria. You see, she still wanted a prince, but she no longer needed one. So she lived happily ever after in the meaningful life she'd created for herself. I am a re recovering frog kisser and I hope that I can help you too. Thank you. Thank you, Tari. Say, so we're gonna open it up for questions, but I do know I have to leave a little bit of time for uh, city updates that I forgot earlier, my apologies. So at this time, I think we'll take a couple questions for Kari, and then we'll, we'll do city updates after that. So questions for Kari. Do I bring this to them? Okay. Yes. Yeah, I imagine today is a, a, a large call for uh, counselors. I imagine it's at a premium today, an all-time high. 
Yeah, yeah, it really is. And uh, what types of things do you offer in that regard? I'm not a counselor, I'm a life coach. And so I rely on my personal experience as well as my life coaching experience. I've been a life coach for four years. So I don't do any deep diving into someone's psyche, <clears throat> but I do, I, I'm kind of like a mentor who helps people through the process because I've been through it before. And I also, <clears throat> excuse me, one of my main programs is the Smart Women's Club. We meet twice a month in Stillwater and I start off with an educational piece and then it's like an informal uh, support group and I function as the group life coach. And women really love to heal together is what I've found. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. Right. Definitely, I've had men contact me too. Um, my target group happens to be women, but um, men can experience it. Children can experience it. You can experience it at any age. People of all income levels experience it, and people of all educational levels experience it. And you can experience it at work. Yeah. Does it sometimes go with physical, but not always? Yeah, it can go with other forms of or abuse. Does it just, uh, accelerate with physical at some point? Well, she asked if it accelerates into physical sometimes, and I yeah, that can certainly happen. Um, but what I want to tell you is that emotional abuse yeah. is equally as damaging as physical abuse. That's what the statistics show because of how much it hurts you and your mental health. Anyone else? Okay, yeah. When you were dating these people before you got involved with them in a relationship, a serious, serious one, did you not see any warning signs? Yes. definitely saw the red flags and I walked right past them because I was very vulnerable at the time and I felt like I needed that person. Then once I got into that relationship, I realized, oh, that was even worse of a step for me because now I'm even more needy. But that's what happens. We're smart. We see the red flags. It doesn't stop us if we're vulnerable. Mm -hmm. Anything? Okay. All right, thank you, Kari. So we're going to wrap it up.